Behold, a gateway to your own past, if you wish. As Caesar loved me, I weep for him. As he was fortunate, I rejoice at him. As he was valiant, I honor him, but as he was ambitious, I see you him. There is tears for his love, joy for his fortune, honor for his valor, and death for his ambition. History is strange, it's alien, and it won't give us what we would like to have. The McPherson Financial Group makes hour three of this Tuesday morning, March 14th of 2023, possible on Bill McLive. And if it's a Tuesday and it's eight o'clock, it's Dave Does History on Bill McLive. Dave Bowman joins us from Silverdale, Washington, up bright and early, before the sun, as he reminded us a little earlier. At least for him, we've got the sun here. We're kind of glad we do. Nice to have you along. You want to weigh in a little later, we'll let you do that. You can always hit us with your comments with the talkback feature on the iHeartRadio app. And uh, the headline at BillMick.com today, Wings, UFOs, and Julius Caesar. Well, we get to the Julius Caesar portion of the story with Dave Does History this morning. Morning, Dave Bowman. How are you, buddy? Salve, citizen. How are you today? That that looked rather uh, Klingon or Romulan. Romulan, it looked. Well, yeah. you know, Romulan, Rome. Yeah, we'll you go with that. that. Works. I like it. And anytime we can get Star Trek in, I'll take it. So Julius his, Julius Caesar and and the American Revolution. I'm interested in seeing the string that puts these together. I guess I guess that's actually kind of a misnomer, Bill. It's it's not so much Julius Caesar as it is the assassination of Julius Caesar. Rather than, okay. well, I just consider Caesar the whole story. It, so there, I'm, everyone, I'm okay with that because everyone does. Yeah, uh, this is uh, of course the 14th of March. It's the day before the Ides of March, which is the day that Julius Caesar is assassinated in mm-hmm. 44 BCE. Now, over the last 2,000 years, this character in history, this person, Julius Caesar, has really become rather remarkable to our entertainment. In Shakespeare, Shakespeare counts it as a tragedy. So if you go look at Shakespeare's plays, Julius Caesar is considered a tragedy. If you watch film, uh, Cleopatra, 1963, Mm -hmm. Shakespeare, or I'm sorry, uh, the film Cleopatra really makes Shakespeare this um, larger-than-life tragic character and we watch cleopatra just weep over his death and she's shattered and until of course mark anthony comes along and then she's back to her old self Mm -hmm. even in tv there was a series back in the 2000s called rome put on by hbo which would get my highest recommendation but it is a very adult themed show so if you're not into that sort of thing uh, you probably don't want to watch it but even that series is told almost exclusive, exclusively from the Julii viewpoint, Julius Caesar's family's viewpoint. And okay. he's a very sympathetic character. He's one, he's one of these people that when he wins, you're happy. When he loses, you're mad. When, and when he gets killed, you're shocked. And the question is, why is Caesar, Caesar such a sympathetic character to us today? When 250 years ago, 260 years ago, the founders and framers of this country almost completely ignored Julius Caesar as a influence on how they developed the ideas that would become the United States of America. And the truth is, it's in his death that they, that they found inspiration, which should make sense to us because Caesar like King George III, was a tyrant. And we'll be back with Dave Bowman. Dave does history on Bill Mick Live in just a minute. One of our sponsors on the program is Chateau Madeline. It is resort-style senior living and memory care, centrally located in Suntree, locally owned, and Eric Cardoon, their executive director, committed to that resort-style atmosphere. Ooh, amenities like you'd find on a cruise ship or at a resort, food, top of the line I, 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 and I found out because I took the tour you can take the tour as well 321-701-8000 the meals at Chateau Madeleine are out of this world the staff is amazing and how they interact with the senior residents there whether it is senior living or memory care that you're seeking for that senior loved one in your family it's a place where life could get better with a real beautiful home and first class nursing care 
reach out and uh, take a look at SuntreeSeniorLiving.com or give them a call and take that tour. 321-701-8000 for Chateau Madeline. Your senior loved one deserves a home like this. Dave Bowman with us with Dave Does History. Dave, so Caesar is the antithesis of what we were looking for in this country. In so many ways, which is why it's so weird to me that after 2,000 years, he's he's portrayed more as a hero in our media and our entertainment. The framers of this country, the founders of this country, never saw him as such. In fact, if you could get in the time machine DeLorean and go back to the 1760s, you would find that almost every American was just absolutely steeped in the history of the Roman Republic, not the Roman Empire, although they were familiar with that. But the Mm -hmm. Roman Republic was really what captivated Americans and captivated the ideas of the founders and later the framers. They were fascinated with people like Cicero, Brutus, Marcus Brutus, who is famous for, of course, when when Julius Caesar is assassinated, et tu, Brute, you know, yeah. you, you also, Brutus. Um, but most of all, the, the most influential of these people was a guy by the name of Cato the Younger, Mar- Marcus Portius Cato, whose name is literally in the American thought processes in the 1700s literally synonymous with the word liberty. If you're talking about Cato, if you're talking about Cato's works, if you're talking about his ideas, you are talking about the American idea of liberty. And what you need to keep in mind is that all of these people, Cicero, Brutus, Cassius, Cato the Younger, they all lost to Julius Caesar. And ultimately, it would cost every one of them their lives. And this is what, these are the people who would inspire the Americans of the 1770s to actually stand against the tyrant, George III. And and it's fascinating to me because we don't see it that way. I mean, we have our interpretations of history. Julius Caesar murdered by these, these lunatics who, you know, we don't even really understand why they, they had, they saw themselves having to do this. We just see it as, well... It was a tragedy because it led to the Roman Empire, led to the fall of the Republic and the Empire. The real tragedy, though, of the assassination of Julius Caesar isn't that it led to the Empire. Well, I mean, it is. But it was the last stand of Republicans, of people who believed in the ideas of liberty. It was their last stand. It was their last chance to save what they saw as the Roman Republic. And they failed. And this is what inspired Americans. In fact, there's a play written they about They did Cato's. know the end story, right? They do know how this ended when they decided, we need to model after this, right? Of course they do. But yeah. they also see it as so important. In fact, Julius, uh, in the play Julius Caesar, um, Shakespeare takes the words of, of Plutarch, and he reminds you that you can love this guy, but you have to love your country more, even if it costs you your life. And that's the way they began to look at things, and it's um, it's fascinating because the even even the Americans of the early of, of the Revolutionary War period were very familiar with a play called Cato the Tragedy, written by Joseph Addison in 17 something early on, and it's this play about Cato, about liberty, about standing against tyranny, that George Washington actually has put on at Valley Forge to inspire the men. Because they have to, they want to motivate people. They want to remind people, why are we doing this? We are standing against a tyrant. We are standing against someone who is violating our liberty, just as Julius Caesar did 2,000 years ago. And if we're going to do this, we have to understand the risks. We have to understand that it's very probable that we'll lose. But we still have to do it because we love our country and we love liberty more than we love the comforts and the pleasures of serving a tyrant. And that's something that I think we've forgotten today. You know, if you go back to the measures versus men argument, we're willing to put up with people that we like, even as they're violating our liberties. And somehow or another, we haven't learned the lesson of why Julius Caesar was assassinated in the first place. And I thought maybe it's time we should go back and kind of... Uh, take a look at that, because without that understanding of things, 
we kind of lose focus on why we have a United States of America to begin with. And that bothers well, me. And, and we are concerned with the direction the country's going, the direction the country's been going for some time. And, and we're not just talking recent American history. It, and it is as if we've lost those lessons of what true liberty means and the responsibility that goes along with it. It's, it's deep. I mean, it really is, Bill. And, and I see in our politicians today far more Julius Caesar than I see Cicero or Cato or even Brutus. Mm -hmm. These are men who are men and women who are about power, which is what Julius Caesar was about. And they convince you by, by drawing yourself to the man, not the measure. The measures of Julius Caesar were pretty clear. He was, in fact, turning himself into a tyrant. Mm -hmm. But, as was King George III. But he was beloved. And, you know, I mean, do, but do we love the man or do we love the country? Do we love our liberty? And sometimes I think we get confused by that stuff. And it's, it's frustrating to me because, again, Americans of that era, the founding and framing eras, knew this history intimately. They understood it. They did not see it as mythology. They didn't see it as rumor. They saw it as fact. This is what happened. This is the lesson we take. And yet we today, having the freedom that we have, trying to exercise the liberty that we have, turn away from it. I mean, how many people are turning out to vote and not paying attention to politics and seeing us get the results we get from those elections? We'll have more. Dave Bowman, Dave Does History on Bill McLive as we take a look at Caesar, his fall, the reason therefore, and how it ties to us here in the U.S. When we continue. Hey, this is Whitey. And this is Hank. And you can listen to our podcast, Two Pine Talk, on all your favorite podcast sources. So come check it out where we talk about two beers and... and Whatever. Everything stuff. <laughs> Listen to Two Pint Talk on iTunes, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. History like you've never heard it. It's Dave Does History on Bill Mick Live. The McPherson Financial Group. If I punch that button, I get to talk. The McPherson Financial Group bringing you the hour. Dave Bowman is with us and, uh, Julius Caesar, what happened there? The Roman Empire after the Roman Republic and Dave tying it to the United States. Dave, we're back at it. You were talking uh, Caesar becoming a tyrant and the Republicans in Rome say, no, 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 this is not where we're going. Well, what's the difference, Bill, between a tyrant and a dictator? Any idea? Yes, because I've heard you podcast right. on this before. Yes. In, in modern times, we've conflated the two terms, dictator and tyrant. What comes to mind, Adolf Hitler, Joseph Stalin, Chairman Mao. So in modern times, the two words have kind of merged into one one thing, much like the two words in English, liberty and freedom. They've They've become synonymous almost. You almost never hear a politician talk about liberty, but they'll talk about freedom. Mm -hmm. But the two words actually in English have distinctly different meanings, but we've lost those meanings and much in the same way that we've lost the difference between the terms dictator and tyrant. In the Roman Republic, the dictator was actually a political office. It was appointed by the Senate or elected by the people, one of the two. And it was, it was, the job was to perform a specific action. So maybe there was a war to be fought uh, as in Fabius's uh, dictatorship, maybe there was a, uh, a a building that needed to be built and somebody needed to be in charge of it, and, or even a, even built a religious festival that needed to be taken care of, and somebody had dropped the ball on it, so they would appoint a dictator to conduct the the religious festival. So they, like a department head or cabinet member, in here. some ways. Okay, but the dictator was limited by tradition and by law. Normally, it was a six-month to one-year office. You had your mandate, this is what you are to do, and you didn't exceed that. If you exceeded that, now within that mandate, you were you were God. I mean, you decided what happened, and, and, and nobody could argue with you. But outside of that mandate, you didn't venture. 
And the few times that people did venture outside of that mandate, you ended up with a lot of problems. Uh, Fabius made hints that he wanted to be outside of that. Sulla becomes uh, a tyrant because he's a dictator who takes over everything, and he eventually has to be destroyed. At, but a tyrant is different in Roman theology, thinking, sorry, not theology. A tyrant in Rome is generally, generally, not always, but generally a dictator who decides to exceed his mandate. So in other words, you are a dictator to do this thing, but then he says, you know what, I want to do more. And if he can get people to go along with him, he is considered a tyrant. And a tyrant in Roman thinking is someone who begins to violate the liberty of the people. And that is dangerous because someone who will violate the liberty of the people is one step away from the one thing that a Roman cannot tolerate at all. And what is that? We'll tell you in 60 seconds. The McPherson Financial Group is our sponsor of Bill McLive. Preparing for your retirement is paramount. You have got to do it. And the earlier you do it, the better off you are. If you're like me, you don't necessarily have the skills to do all that planning on your own. The understanding of the investment world and the tools that are available to you to mitigate tax exposure and to get the most out of your investment dollars. Well, that's where Art and the staff at the McPherson Financial Group come in handy. You can call them at 321-253-2016 or see them online at mcphersonfinancialgroup.com. They live and work in this world every day. They follow the trends. They see what is likely ahead and make their plans and your plans with you with that in mind. The McPherson Financial Group LLC is a financial services firm. They offer a broad array of products and services that include insurance and annuities. They're licensed in Florida. Yes, they compensate me for the endorsement, but yeah, like I told you, they do handle my financial planning. Don't forget their uh, show this weekend on WMMB. You can catch it three times. It's called The Art of Money. Give you some insight on what they're thinking, and they can help you like they have me, and I appreciate them for that and for bringing you this hour of our program. Dave Bowman with Dave Does History. So, What is it that they're not wanting? Well, I'm going to oversimplify things here because we're trying to compress 500 years of history into, you know, less than five minutes. So, dude, we got 29 minutes here. I mean, come on. (laughs) Not for the next break. We don't. That's true. So in 49 BCE, Julius Caesar crosses the Rubicon River. Now, we've all heard this phrase, ah, cross the Rubicon, the die is cast. This is a major violation of Roman law. He has crossed the Rubicon River. He has entered Italy under arms. He is essentially saying, this is now a civil war. So he is now considered an outlaw. But, as they say, history is written by the winners. And in this particular war, he manages to defeat Pompey, Cicero, Cato, and Brutus, the Optimates as they're known, and win the war. He is Caesar, who is actually a very noble family. He should belong to the Optimates, which are the the Senate and those people. But he is functioning as a populare. He is really appealing to the general public. He is he is really a populist kind of guy. And he does something that is almost unthinkable in Rome. He extends forgiveness to his enemies. So after he defeats them, particularly Brutus, um, to a degree Pompey, although it doesn't end well in that, uh, some of the other Cicero's, he, he forgives them. Now, in Roman thinking, once you've been forgiven by your enemy, you have accepted your enemy's victory and their leadership and dominance over you. Do you see how that works? Mm-hmm. So. Cato. So he was a political manipulator. Bingo. He was the ultimate politician. Yeah. Cato, on the other hand, who is the American hero, cannot and will not accept Caesar's forgiveness. He will not accept a pardon from Caesar because he doesn't believe that Caesar has the authority to pardon him for anything he's done because he hasn't done anything wrong. And okay. Cato ends up dying in this conflict. After the, the conflict is mostly over, C- Caesar is elected as dictator of Rome three times. The first time he's elected for one year. The second time they get together and say, well, we might as well make him dictator for 10 years because we really like this guy. Everybody likes Caesar. I mean, he's a great guy. And, oh, by the way, he keeps giving us money. 
you know, where's he getting the money that he's giving you? Well, he's taking it from the the coffers and giving it to you. And the third time, so he mentioned the tax cap too. Oh okay. yes, uh-huh. yes. And the third time they elect, they elect him as dictator for life. So by 44 BCE, Julius Caesar is dictator of Rome for life. And the optimates, the Brutus, Cicero, they begin to see him as violating the people's liberties. He is taking this dictatorship role too far, and he is becoming a ruler over them. And what is known, he it, it is apparent that he wants to become the one thing that a Roman cannot tolerate, which is a king. You can have a dictator. You can almost even have a tyrant. But you cannot have a king. And it appears to them that Julius Caesar wants to be king of Rome. Which, by the way, they haven't had for 500 years since they chased the last guy out. And this is something that Brutus's ancestor, the original Brutus, made every Roman take an oath that if you think somebody wants to be a king or if somebody makes it clear they want to be a king, it is your duty as a Roman to kill him. And so, by February of 44 BCE, people like Brutus are convinced that Caesar wants to be king. And that means somebody's got to take him out. And they made the decision. Other factors in play, economy, supplies, anything, is all of that in play here too? Are are they having other governmental issues? To the degree that Caesar is using his power to really please the people. He's building gardens, he's giving them money, tax refunds, and, and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. But, but as a general economic thing, uh, it's, not, it's not as driven by e- economics as you might think. It's really driven How it applies by... to the day. When we come back with Dave Bowman. beloved republic is in the hands of madmen. This is a dark day, and I stand at a fork in the road. I can abide the law and surrender my arms to the Senate and watch the republic fall to tyranny and chaos. Or I can go home with my sword in my hand and run those maniacs to the Tarpian Rock! Find our podcasts on the iHeartRadio app or the podcast section at BillMick.com. The McPherson Financial Group bringing you the hours. Dave does history with us. Dave Bowman joining us from Silverdale, Washington. You want in as we're talking the connection between Julius Caesar, the fall of the uh, Roman Empire, and the founding of the United States. 321-768-1240. So, Dave, you've noted many times in, in our discussions and others that the day Bowman show.com that our founders knew history. They understood governmental systems from years, eons before they were in place to try to do something here. What are they learning from all this and where are they take it? Well, more than even that, Bill, they understood the danger of a single human being having too much power, having too much love from the people. They, they, they saw that much as the Roman Romans did, as very dangerous. Now, there's an incident in February of 44 BCE at the festival of Lupercalia, which is probably my favorite Roman festival, um, roughly equivalent, again, very roughly equivalent to our Valentine's Day, although with all the Roman so vices. So you're saying orgies? Yes. With okay. all the Roman <laughs> vices that you would expect. Okay. But one of the things that happens is there's a big race, running race through the city. And one of the runners that year is a guy by the name of Mark Antony. You've probably heard of him. Mm -hmm. Mark Antony, as he's running, stops in front of Caesar's platform there and whips out, and I'm not even going to describe what I mean by whipping out, uh, a a crown (laughs) that he's been carrying in this race that he runs almost naked. And he runs up to Caesar, and he starts to put it on Caesar's head. And the crowd is shocked because this is a, this is a, 
you're crowning him king. And Caesar, technically, I mean, he holds up his hand and he refuses it. And he does this three times, and it's it's basically seen as an act to try to convince the the optimates that he doesn't really want to be king because he could have been king this day and he didn't really want to. But they see it as he really wants to be king. And so a Stage month, event by Caesar and Mark Antony? Yes. Anthony? Yes. Okay. Okay. So a month later, on the Ides of March, March 15th, tomorrow, they strike Caesar down. Now. The founders of this nation, America, saw those who killed Caesar as the heroes because they attacked and destroyed a tyrant. The tragedy is they did not succeed in saving their republic. But even Brutus will say at the funeral oration, because he goes to the funeral, Brutus, one of the guys who killed him, uh, to Brute, he goes to the funeral, and what he kind of says, and I'm paraphrasing here, look, I love Caesar just as much as you do, but I love liberty more than Caesar. And so, because Caesar's ambition was to be king, I am bound by Roman honor to kill him. It's that kind of inspiration, along with Cato and others that inspire Washington and the Continental Army, to understand that the tragedy of Shakespeare's Julius Caesar is not the death of Caesar, it's the death of liberty that happens because of that. Mm -hmm. These founders knew what they were getting into, they saw themselves not as the ideological descendant of a tyrant, Julius Caesar, but of those who opposed tyranny and the tyrant, Julius Caesar. That's, who, that's the side they wanted to be on. They knew the danger. They knew that they could and probably would lose. But miracles happened, and we won. They saw King George III, who was beloved by his people. This is one of the biggest myths of American history, is that King George was evil, King George III. King George III is one of the most beloved kings in the history of England. They loved this guy. And in fact, most Americans were quite fond of him until he started taking for himself liberties from the American people. Then they saw him as Julius Caesar, and they needed to throw him off, although not quite the same way that they did on the Ides of March. And the question we find ourselves asking today is, when we see these politicians in front of us promising us stuff, just like Julius Caesar did, mm -hmm. just like Roman uh, empire emperors would later do, what are we impressed by? Are we impressed by our love for the person or our love for liberty? Because our love for liberty means we have to attach ourselves to measures, not to men. And we have a duty as Americans who love liberty to protect and defend liberty, not a person. I'm not saying we should kill them. I'm saying we should reject them. We should choose Cato, not Caesar. And we'll be back in 60 seconds. Dave does history on Bill McLeod. 321-768-1240 if you want in as Dave does history here on Bill McLeod. We get to those phones momentarily. Dave, as you were closing on this, it struck me that in those days, at least for those Romans who were believing in and supporting the Republic, that an oath meant something to them. And they lived by it, stood by it, and killed by it. And comparing that to today, and an oath of office means relatively little, especially once somebody attains that office and realizes they're going to be there as long as the term limits will allow them to be there. Which is, you know, much like a dictator in Roman, you know, they, they supposedly have a mandate for that office. This is what you're mm -hmm. supposed to do, and this is how long you can do it for. But how often do they, do they put as much work into what they should be doing as they do in trying to extend that? Mm -hmm. Which is the sign of a tyrant. That's someone trying to exceed their mandate. And tyrannies or evil, not as evil well, as a as king. you and I both talked in the last two weeks, an oath to uh, protect and defend the constitution of the country, the constitution of our various states, and how easily and how quickly is it forgotten? Very quickly. And that, as you know, that really upsets me. So 
I don't think, you want, to, I don't think you want to get me going down that road this morning. You can hear as well, the Dave Bowman show.com links for you on the show page today at billmick.com where the headline for the page is wings, UFOs and Julius Caesar to the phones. We go line one. You're on Bill Mick live. Good morning. Hey, Dave um, and Bill. And this is Steve from Melbourne. Yes, yeah, Steve. Um, I've always wondered, and, and I've always wondered about the politicians that we have today that just keep spending us into, and now we got the county board, just, we never, we never have a budget. We just keep increasing it. And, and what is the long-term plan? And are, are they basically Julius Caesar? Because they really don't care until something happens to them. I mean, they're just, they're not working for us. Well, Steve, I honestly think term limits are part of this problem. I think that if we, if they knew they were going to be there beyond an eight year term, if they knew that there would be repercussions throughout or that they had the opportunity to be there beyond eight years, as it is now in the House, in the Senate, in the county commission, and now in the school board with 12 year term limits in play or wanting to be in play, then, uh, you're looking at, I've got a limited time, got to get what I can, got to do what I can, and there'll be no repercussions for me because I won't be there when these things hit. Dave, how do you see? Well, I, I, I said this this week. I don't. I don't think politicians think about the future at all. I think they think about right now and power for themselves. And that's not unlike, I, I'll give Julius Caesar credit for this. He did have a long-term plan that he never got to fulfill, but that long-term plan included putting the crown on his own head. And that was not acceptable and shouldn't be acceptable to us. Yeah, that's very, very true. Um, are there examples you see? I mean, other than the general ones we've outlined here, are there places where you see where this Caesar model, and I mean Caesar himself, being followed by these folks like Zero Inslee or somebody like that? I I see a lot of, particularly in the last couple of weeks, Bill. I this attacks these attacks on liberty, specifically the First Amendment, freedom of the press, freedom of the speech. This idea, and it, it it's it's angering that it's Republicans leading this, and it's nationwide. It's not just Florida. Um, the idea that the framers were very clear: freedom of the press, freedom of the speech, are foundational bricks. And when you destroy those bricks, nothing else matters. If you care about the Second Amendment. You should care more about the First Amendment, because if the First Amendment goes away, the second one's not far behind. Mm -hmm. And yet, what do we see? We see people talking about how how unfair it is that that people can write blogs criticizing us or it's it's too easy for them to, quote unquote, defame us. And, you know, I read your bill down there that Mr. Broder put together. That bill didn't have a chance in hell of passing the courts. I mean, it was a clear violation of the First Amendment. Even Kim Commando said that on her Monday update after the announcement was made the week before. The bill was written so broadly that me up here in Washington saying something about your governor down there could fit into their bill, which is outrageous. But the idea that people would even propose this. So my question to Mr. Brodeur is, what is your understanding of liberty? What is your understanding of the First Amendment? Because you clearly didn't put any thought into this. You're mad. Your ego is being stro- isn't being stroked. And like a Roman dictator who thinks that you have unlimited authority within this range, you're proscribing free speech. Well, once you do that, what else are you going to get rid of? So to me, yeah, I see it every day. I, I see this kind of behavior. I see it in a, in the people who love Caesar. We start talking about this politician is great. That politician is fantastic. I love this guy. And we never talk about the fact that is that person defending liberty? Are they defending the Constitution? Or are they proposing things that are sound good on paper, look good in the garden, but really are just violations of the people's liberties? Mm-hmm. And, and some of them are shocking. We, we've got uh, hate speech legislation being proposed in Tallahassee. You have uh, heard and seen some of the things going up and down the, the east coast of Florida 
regarding anti-Semitic flyers and things being thrown around. And again, back to, to your first position on the First Amendment is that the solution to bad speech is better speech. I love liberty more than I love any, any person, any politician, any law. I love liberty. I, I could spend hours talking about the difference between liberty and freedom, but really our framers fought for liberty, not for freedom. And we need to understand that. And it's that love of liberty that requires us to destroy things that would attack liberty. And we don't seem to be willing to do it. Yep. Well, maybe we get stronger. By the way, Dave's not going to be with us for a couple of weeks. He's got to take a couple of week hiatus and we'll get him back here quick as we can. Cause I love these days. Dave Bowman. Thank you. The McPherson Financial Group made the hour possible tomorrow. A wide open Wednesday. If it's on your mind. It's on Bill McLive. We'll see you in the morning at six.